Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again for uh, the great introduction and invitation. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to be able to present at the uh, Kent seminar. Uh, actually, I've been, you know, since I was a student, I received the Kent se seminar uh, announcement uh, quite often. And uh, it's it's kind of uh, uh, surreal to me, but uh, it's my turn to present the Kent seminar. So it's really an honor to thank, thanks again for the invitation. So today I'm going to share with you uh, some of the work that um, um, that we worked on with the uh, railway transportation on um, probabilistic modeling of optimal placement strategies of hazardous materials, real cars, and freight trains. So uh, this research uh, is a collaborative research uh, you know, with my uh, previous advisor, Professor uh, Chris Parkin and also Mr. Xing Hao Liu and uh, Mr. Jamin Kim at the uh, Railtech at UIUC. And so, and we also uh, get support from the our industry partners uh, at the, the Association of American Railroads and the Canadian National Railway. So thank you for their support. A little bit about myself. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I previously uh, studied at the Railtech and at UIUC and uh, I've got my bachelor degrees at National Town University. And right now I'm the assistant professor at the Department of Transportation and Logistic Management at NYCU. Um, so at NYCU right now, I've uh, been working on a series of research related to quantitative and causal train accident analysis, uh, heavy haul freight rail transportation risk, uh, hazardous material transportation, as well as railway system safety management. So uh, to begin, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, kind of introduce in a broad uh, scale on the addressing the real hazardous materials or hazmat transportation safety. So transportation of hazardous materials uh, or hazmat, in short, is an important economic activity in the United States. Uh, over 2.6 million of uh, hazmat car loads were transported in North America uh, in 2021, and the majority of them had arrived at this destination without uh, an incident. Um, however, despite the low probability of a rail hazmat release, uh, any such accident uh, or occurrence has the potential for severe consequences. Uh, overall, hazmat cars, uh, uh, tank cars, uh, account for uh, roughly 74% of all hazmat shipments. And therefore, uh, it is very really important to, um, you know, to improve and assure the uh, hazmat transportation safety, and it is an ongoing priority for railroads, hazmat shippers, uh, tank car manufacturers, federal government, and other stakeholders. So, uh, you know, freight trains carrying hazmats can be uh, loan for operational efficiency, uh, and they can be uh, carried in two major configurations. And these are so-called manifest trains, where a mixture of different types of, you know, freight cars, uh, including both hazardous material cars and other type of freight cars. And then there's another type of trains called unit trains, uh, where the entire train load uh, is, is carried by, uh, is carrying single commodity with uh, usually single type of cars. So um, a key research question here is that, you know, we have, we have been operating long trains um, for freight and uh, including hazardous materials and non-hazardous materials. And so a key research question here is that does the positioning of you know, hazmat cars in the freight train affect their risk of being involved in accidents? So um, you know, it is possible that the freight train uh, will be involved in, in, in accidents, but uh, you know, most of the time, not the whole freight train will be involved. And so a certain portion of the freight train will be impacted. And so we, you know, we were wondering, you know, does the positioning of those cars uh, matters uh, in the train that would, uh, you know, different part of the train will have different likelihood um, of being impacted by a train accident. So it it matters in, in certain aspects. And the, the first one will be the effectiveness of hazmat car placement strategies. So, you know, if we can, uh, if we figure out maybe certain position uh, of the uh, trains that, that have lower uh, likelihood of being involved in an accident, then we can, you know, maybe we can place the hazmat cars, 
in the, in in the, that part of the train to reduce its likelihood of getting impacted. Um, then we can also consider the evaluation of some uh, trade-off risk between the placement of plasma cars and the additional real car switching and movement. This is because that if we are going to, uh, you know, develop a specific train configurations to put the hazmat cars at certain locations in the train, then we it requires additional movement of those cars uh, in the terminals or in the yards. And that may create additional risk because of these movements. And last but not least, you know, we from the network scale, we, uh, this also um, relates to the decision making of the operational plans regarding train configurations. So uh, we want to try to address these questions um, and that's kind of like the motivation of our research. So previously, there, there has been research that kind of look into this uh, from certain aspects. So for example, the uh, previous studies have found that the location of the real car in a train consists of its probability of being involved in the derailment. So the particular uh, location in a train um, that, you know, get involved in the development will vary by because due to certain factors and research has also shown that the number of cars derailed this represents kind of like the severity of a derailment uh, is also affected by the position of the first derailed vehicle in a train so it also uh, is relevant with the, uh, the the positioning of the cars in a train and the previous research uh, so far has found that the rail cars in the middle of the train generally have higher derailment probability and this is also uh, position dependent now we can have a different length of the train uh, but at the same time uh, you know if we look at the the, uh, the distribution of the cars derailed in a train from the historical train accidents uh, we found that uh, the rail cars in the middle of the train have higher likelihood of getting involved so in addition to the derailment severity, we also uh, want to understand what is the uh, severity of the number of hazmat cars derailed, uh, representing the potential for likelihood of the release event and more severe consequences. So in the previous slide, we, we talked about train derailment, right? And in train derailment, uh, any, you know, any cars could get involved in a derailment. Now, if the train is carrying hazmat, uh, what we also care about is whether or not these hazmat cars uh, would derail because if the hazmat cars are derailed, there's a possibility that the derailed hazmat cars uh, could release its content or lading. And if that's the case, then it might result in further um, you know, consequences such as you know, uh, you know, train fire or people getting injured or even fatally injured and other you know, more severe consequences. And so, um, you know, what's shown here is a, uh, a series of events that leads to uh, the hazardous material release. Um, you know, it's conducted by uh, another alumni, Realtek, uh, Dr. Shangdu. So here we can see that uh, when train is involved in the derailment, uh, it could cause a, a number of, you know, certain number of cars derailed. And among those derailed cars, some might be hazmat cars. And that's, that's where the hazmat cars will get involved. And then, you know, once hazmat cars uh, derail, there is a chance that they, some of them will release and then leading to uh, some consequences. And so in the process, uh, what we want to focus today uh, in this presentation is the, the severity of the hazmat cars uh, derailed and involved in a train accident. So, um, so here, the model that uh, I'm going to present is, uh, the, the goal of the model is to analyze the effect of hazmat car placement in trains on the probability of their derailment severity. So we want to understand the probability distribution of hazmat car derailment sizes. And also we want to know that given the train configuration and the operational characteristics, what will be the expected number of <coughs> hazmat cars derailed given, uh, you know, given these um, conditions. We also want to understand the effect of certain factors that would affect the uh, the hazmat car derailment sizes as well as the expected number of their derailments. And these include the trend length, number of hazmat cars in a train, as well as the train speed. We also uh, attempted to look into some other factors, uh, but you know, as we were alluded to at the end, uh, there are some limitation uh, due to the data 
and the resolution of the data uh, that we were not able to consider those uh, for now, but we will include those in our future research. So let's start with uh, the, the model for uh, assessing the hazmat car placement. So the model consists of uh, uh, three parts. So the first part is the input where we uh, where we develop, we first set the train makeup. And then the, this includes the number of uh, hazmat cars, number of non-hazmat cars, including locomotive in the train. And then we also um, you know, determine the positioning of the hazmat and non-hazmat cars. And then we also set the uh, the derailment speed or the, you know, the, the, the speed of derailment at the time. And then there's a, there are two core models uh, that were based on previous research that we use uh, in order to develop this uh, hazmat car placement uh, model to assess the probability of hazmat car derailment size. And these are the probabilistic model for the first derail vehicle. So under so this is uh, used to uh, get the probability of the certain of derailing uh, cer certain uh, rail cars with the first car being at a specific position uh, in a train. And then there's another model that uh, you know that's related to the uh, the number of cars derailed. So it looks at the total severity of the train derailment. Now, the, both models uh, were derived based on uh, historical train accident data. So, you know, so if we uh, update the underlying data uh, for these models, uh, the models could uh, change, be updated, and be updated as well. Uh, so, but we use this mod, these two models, to develop a new model uh, to calculate the number of the hazmat cars derailed, given the number of the derailed, total derailed rail cars in the accident. So it's a, there, there's a slight difference between uh, these models, right? So the first, so the two core models uh, look into the total number of cars derailed. And the new model that we developed uh, looks at the number of hazmat cars derailed. Um, and then uh, once we develop this model, we'll be able to uh, calculate uh, two major objectives. And the, these are the distribution of hazmat cars, uh, hazmat car derailment size, and the expected number of you know, hazmat cars derailed. So um, a brief introduction to the two underlying models. Uh, so the probability that a car at a specific position will will be involved in the derailment, you know, can be you know, calculated using uh, you know the two models below. So if we first look at the, uh, let me see if I can use the pointer. Okay, so the first figure on the left uh, shows the first derail vehicle or FDV distribution. So on the x-axis, this is the position in a train of the uh, first derail vehicle. The y-axis is the number of derailments. So this, um, you know, the chart basically shows the distribution of the positioning uh, in a train that that the, the first car getting involved in the, in the train derailment here and then we can use this. This is based on the, uh, the, the historical trend accident data from the Federal Railroad Administration and the US DOT. So, we'll, so the previous research used this data to develop a, you know, a function of probabilistic distribution for the FDV. And likewise, another uh, probabilistic model was developed for the derailment size based on the you know, empirical trend accident data. And so these were uh, the two models that we used to develop the new model for the hazmat cars derailed. So combining the two models, uh, one can develop a position dependent probability of a real car derailing. So what's shown here on the X axis is a vehicle position in the train on the Y axis is a derailment probability. So with the historical train accident data, uh, we can, we can derive this is all, this is also from uh, the previous research uh, done by our local line, Dr. Shangdu. So we can, for, for individual position in a train uh, and at different train speed, we, uh, you know, we will be able to uh, get the derailment probability of that particular car at that position. So, so this is uh, useful and then it's informative in terms of understanding the risk of you know, getting involved in the, uh, in the derailment for individual cars uh, in the train. The train speed at the time of the derailment also affects the position dependent derailment probability. Um, not only directly, you know, if we compare uh, the same position, they have different derailment probability, but also the overall distribution 
of that is affected by the train speed. So the model that we developed to address the hazmat cars derailment probability uh, is based on uh, based on this because this chart shows the probability of individual car position uh, individual car position. But what we want to know here is what is the probability of a specific size of hazmat cars derail? You know, what's the probability of having two hazmat cars derail? What's the probability of having five hazmat cars derailed, and so on. So uh, we first present an example of position-dependent uh, derailment scenario. So let me give you an example using a five-vehicle train. So here we can see that uh, there is a train with you know, two locomotives here uh, and then with three real cars. And then the fourth car in the train is a hazmat car. And so uh, this is you know, of our interest. So let's say we want to calculate the probability of the fourth vehicle in the train being affected by, by a train, uh, by an accident. So we can consider two basic scenarios. Uh, the first scenario is when the derailment involving um, you know, the fourth vehicle as the FDV in a train. So the fourth vehicle uh, is the first vehicle derailed in the train. So in this case, the fourth vehicle will be affected, right? Because it's a first derailed vehicle. The second scenario is the derailment where the first derailed vehicle is ahead of the fourth vehicle. Let's say number two. So L2 here. And the derailment size is large enough so that the fourth vehicle is involved. So let's say there, the FDV is number two, but there are three cars in total that derailed, right? So number two, number three and number four. So there, there are three cars, assuming that the number of derailed cars, they are continuous, right? There's no cars derailing at the front and then there's no uh, separate cars derailing in the back. Assume that they are all uh, connected, the, the, derailed, the derailed cars. And so in this case, the fourth car is also affected. So to, to the total probability of the fourth vehicle derailing is the sum of the, all the probabilities of the scenarios of the derailments affecting the fourth vehicle, right? So it could be either any derailments whose first derailed vehicle is a fourth vehicle, or any derailments whose first derailed vehicle is somewhere ahead of the fourth vehicle, but its total derailment size uh, includes the fourth vehicle. Okay, so this is uh, how we calculate the, the, the position dependent derailment scenario. Now we can give them the notation for this. So here, if we look at the, uh, the notation down below here, the P32, so this is T32, it's a, it represents a scenario. So T32 means that a, a, one, uh, a derailment scenario where the first zero vehicle is three and the number of cars, the ND uh, is two. So it represents a specific uh, the Roman scenario uh, categorized by the FDV and the number of cars derailed. So the probability of this scenario is you know, this probability T32. So we can use this to then calculate the distribution of hazmat cars derailed, as well as the expected number of cars, uh, a number of hazmat cars derailed. So the two calculations delving below shows the example of this. So we, I'll take one of it as an example. So the first one, P and HD, so the NHD represents the number of hazmat cars derailed. So what what are the scenarios where uh, you know there where one hazmat car would derail, right? So using the example train consists on the top, where we have the two locomotives up front, there's one non-hazmat car, and then there are two hazmat cars in the back. So the scenarios for one hazmat car derailed will be, you know, the first one, T14, it means that the first uh, the, the first derailed vehicle is number one, and then there are four cars derailed, right? So this will affect only one hazmat car, not two, there's only one. Similarly, if the first derailed vehicle is two, and then there are three cars derailed, then we can see the fourth car is also affected. And so on and so forth, we basically counted all the scenarios that affect one hazmat car. And then we can get the uh, probability of those based on the, the, the two underlying models. And then we would do the same for two hazmat cars derailed. And then just to show one example, if the first derailed vehicle is not is one, and then there are five cars derailed, and that will affect both both the fourth and the fifth vehicle in the train, 
and that will include two hazmat cars, right? So we can we can sum all the probabilities of these scenarios, and we can get a total probability of the two num two hazmat cars derailed. Now, if you want to calculate the expected number of cars derailed, this this will also be very simple. We take the 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 uh, uh, the number of hazmat cars derailed multiplying by the probability of uh, you know that number of hazmat cars derailed. Okay, so this is the uh, the model development. So now to um, then we develop some case study to present how uh, to present the model that we developed. So we consider a train, you know, this we, we consider is a representative of uh, a, you know a, a freight train that has you know certain amount of hazmat cars. So we uh, consider a 110 vehicle uh, train that has four locomotives at front, and there are 35 hazmat cars and then 71 non hazmat cars. And then we consider two operational speeds, 25 miles per hour and 50 miles per hour. And now we, because we have 35 hazmat cars in total, and so we want to, you know, see what's the likelihood or what's the uh, probability of various hazmat car derailment sizes uh, when those hazmat cars are placed at different positions, right? So we consider five different placement scenarios. We put all the hazmat cars at the front of the train. We put them all at, at, at the end of the train. We put half of them at front, half of them at back, uh, or we put uh, all of the hazmat cars in the middle, or we put them randomly. So we, we design, uh, we use a probability distribution to say, all right, let's put uh, all the, the hazmat cars randomly in the train. And we look at uh, how the model uh, calculates the probability of hazmat cars derailed in these scenarios. Okay. So the five the, to illustrate the five scenarios, they look like this, right? So if we put all hazmat cars uh, up front, it's you know, it would be here, and then if we put all of them in the back, and we put them all in, in the middle, and so forth. So this you know illustrates uh, what what it looks like in a train if, when we put these hazmat cars in different places. Okay, and this is a result. So after we run the model with the specific train makeup and then with the specific operational conditions like the train speed, then we can get, you know, we can get several results. You know, the first one that I'll, I show here is the expected number of hazmat cars derailed uh, for different scenarios. So here we show the five scenarios uh, and then we can see the blue bars are, uh, blue bars are the results for 25 miles per hour. And then the orange bars are the results for the 50 uh, miles per hour. And so here we can see that the different placing hazmat cars at different positions in a train uh, makes the expected number of hazmat cars derailed different. And the position in the train, um, you know, where the number of hazmat cars derailed, uh, you know, was minimized or differed with the di different derailment speed. It means that, you know, if we look at the blue bars, the scenario that has the lowest expected number of hazmat cars derailed is you know, the back scenario, meaning we put all the hazmat cars uh, at the end of the train. But if the, the, the speed is uh, 50 miles per hour, we found out that the, the scenario that resulted in the lowest expected number of cars derailed is putting half of the hazmat cars up front and then the other half uh, in the back. So the train, the derailment speed actually, have, uh, you know, based on the, the model that we developed, the, the speed somehow affected the scenarios uh, you know, of the placement strategies in terms of the expected number of hazmat cars derailed. Uh, in addition to the expected number of hazmat cars derailed, it kind of shows the overall picture uh, of the, the hazmat car derailment severity. We can also look at the distribution of the different hazmat car derailment severity under different scenarios. So the figure presented here on the x-axis shows the number of hazmat cars derailed. On the y-axis shows the probability of more than certain number of hazmat cars derailed. So the way that the, the way that we read this chart is that you know if it's five on the x-axis and the corresponding probability means that uh, the probability of having five or more hazmat cars derailed um, and, and, the, and the same thing for others. So that's why you see uh, all the all the lines are, are decreasing because it's you know the probability showing is showing the the probability of having that number or more uh, cars derailed. So here we can see that the different scenarios kind of you know show uh, you know different probabilities over uh, you know at different locations. 
So there are there are two uh, takeaways here. The first one is that uh, the middle train scenario, so you know putting all the hazmat cars in the middle, had the highest probability at higher uh, hazmat car studio <clears throat> severity, so represented by the the red dashed line here. So right, so uh, so in general, um, if we put all the hazmat cars in the middle of the train, it will result uh, in a higher uh, higher probability of having more hazmat cars derailed. Uh, there is a drop here for the front and back scenario, uh, the, and then it means the probability of for front and back scenario. Uh, decrease sharply after the number of hazmat cars derailed exceeds the number of hazmat cars placed at either end of the train. So because we we split the hazmat cars to the both end of the train, so the likelihood of derailing more than half of those cars is really low because that means that you pretty much need to derail the whole train in order to derail that many numbers of hazmat cars. And that's why there's a drop in the probability here. Okay. We also conducted a, uh, some sensitivity analysis to understand what are other factors that could affect the hazmat car derailment severity. And the first one is the derailment speed. So we look at, you know, uh, given the same train concepts and you know different scenarios, uh, what's the effect of the train speed? And you know, as you can see here, the x-axis shows the train speed, the y-axis shows the expected number of hazmat cars derailed, and you know, it it. it uh, as, as, as expected, we can see that as, as the speed increases, the expected number of hazmat cars derailed would increase. Um, the the order of different scenarios, um, you know, did change uh, at different train speeds. So this is um, some results uh, that we can observe here. We also look at the effect of train length. So we want to understand uh, whether or not different scenarios perform uh, differently uh, under various trend length. And it turns out that the, the relative uh, ranking or the relative the expected number of cars derailed uh, for different scenarios are consistent uh, at different trend length. But as the trend length increase, of course, we can expect that the number of uh, hazmat cars derailed will increase in general. We can also look at uh, the different proportion, uh, number of hazmat cars in the train. So what we want to understand is that if, so, you know, if the train, uh, the, the same train length, but we if, if we have more hazmat car cars in the same train, uh, how would it affect the, um, the the number of hazmat cars derailed? Uh, so, but of course, you know the if you have more hazmat cars in in the train with the, even the same train length, you are expecting more hazmat cars to derailed if it if they are involved in the derailment. Um, and then, but you can see that the uh, the different the differential effect is uh, uh, you know quite obvious for, for um, all proportions of hazmat cars here uh, at the different speed. So uh, well, what's interesting here is that you can also observe some you know, differences in the, uh, the scenarios that leads to the lowest expected number of hazmat cars derailed. In fact, the proportion of hazmat cars in a train uh, shows some interesting uh, effects that I will show uh, in a later chart. So, one thing that we found out, you know, as we um, as I showed in the previous slides, uh, typically, you know, putting all the hazmat cars in the back, you know, at the end of the train, or put uh, half of them at front and, and and at the end of the train, results in the lowest expected number of hazmat cars derailed. But because we when we design the scenarios for the case study, we generally put all the uh, hazmat cars like as a you know as a block to different positions, right? So we kind of designed uh, several positions. But if we want to get precise uh, scenario, precise train makeup that uh, that have the, the lowest, uh, the exact lowest expected number of cars derailed, uh, we, we want to see if we can find that. So the front, so we see that the front and back scenario considered, uh, assume that half of the hazmat cars were at the front and half of them at the back for convenience, right? Because we designed a case uh, the case scenario for the case study, but it's it is possible that you know we when we vary the ratio of hazmat cars at the front and at the back will further reduce the number of hazmat cars derailed. In other words, between these two scenarios, maybe there is a the point that we can we can actually reach the lowest expected number of hazmat cars derailed uh, between these two scenarios. So uh, what we 
did is that we, we conducted a more systematic and fine-grained investigation of the effect of hazmat car positioning. Um, so what we did is, is pretty simple. We start with one scenario, and then, for example, we start with a scenario where all the hazmat cars are uh, back, and then we put all the ha we put one hazmat car from the back to the front one at a time, and then we calculate the expected number of car uh, expected number of hazmat cars derailed uh, for that scenario, and then we move another car, another hazmat car from the uh, the back to the front, and then we calculate the the expected number of hazmat cars derailed, and so on and so forth, until we move all the cars from the end to the front, and then we can you know get the 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 lowest um, uh, the point of all the expected number of car, hazmat cars derailed here. So this is kind of like exhaustive, locally exhaustive method to to obtain the lowest expected number of cars. So um, then I will show you a series of you know figures that that had that consider uh, different trend length um, and then different train speed and different proportion of hazmat cars in the same train to showcase you know how these factors affect the the optimal um, you know hazmat cars placement by optimal I means that it will result in the lowest expected number of cars a uh, number of hazmat cars derailed in a given scenario okay so uh I will show one figure first before I show like a small multiple with multiple figures all together. Uh, this figure shows the expected number of hazmat cars derailed with a 70 uh, car, 70 vehicle trains with a 10% proportion of hazmat cars, meaning that there there's seven hazmat cars. And the exit X axis shows the number of hazmat cars moved to the front from the all back scenario. So remember, we start out by putting all the hazmat cars at the end of the train, and then we move the cars, you know, one by one. So the x-axis shows how many number of hazmat cars will you move from the end to the front. And the y-axis shows the expected number of hazmat cars derailed. So we can consider the zero here as the base case scenario, where all the cars, all the hazmat cars are, are at the end of the train. And then in the middle, you know, this is the half front, half back scenario, where you put half of the cars to the front of the train. And then if, after you move all the cars to the front, this is the front scenario. Uh, you know, if you recall our, our five initial scenarios considered here. So here you can see that we have the curves developed for uh, all the different train speeds. And so here uh, they, they are uh, different curves, you know, and, and it's curved because they're, we, our hypothesis that the, the actual optimal point is between somewhere between the back scenario and the half front and half back scenario, and it is strong here because the, the the black points on each curve represents the point where we have the lowest expected number of hazmat cars derailed here. What's interesting here is that at different train speeds, this optimal points differ a little bit, right? So like at lower speed, you don't need to move anything from the back, you just keep all the hazmat cars at the end. But as the speed increases, uh, you they you might want to move maybe one or two cars from the from the rear of the train to to the front of the train that will result in the lowest uh, expected number of cars derailed. And we'll look at some more figures uh, to analyze the effect of different factors. Um, so in addition to using the number of hazmat cars uh, as an x-axis, we can use the percentage because sometimes when there are different trend lengths, we want to normalize by the total trend length. So instead of Presenting the total, the the actual the, the number of hazmat cars, we can also use the proportion of hazmat cars uh, from the you know we and 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 again the 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 percentage here shown is the percentage of the cars moved from the back to the front of the train. Okay, okay. So here, uh, the this is a small multiples that shows the ex, you know the expected number of hazmat cars derailed uh, for the seventy car train. Uh, with all different hazmat car proportion in the train uh, and at different speeds. So the x-axis, again, for each figure shows the percentage of hazmat cars moved to the front from the back scenario. The y-axis of each figure shows the expected number of hazmat cars derailed. But here, and they, all the different curves, they, they show the different speed from 10 miles per hour to 70 miles per hour. 
what's different in each figure is the percent proportion of the hazmat cars uh, in a train. So here is a 10% and then increase, you know, to 30%, 50%, 70%, 90% to 100%. So 100% means that all the cars in the train, except the locomotives, are hazmat cars. So you can see it makes sense that, you know, there's no difference, right? All, all the, because all the cars are uh, hazmat cars. So it does not matter uh, where you put those cars, it's gonna result in the same expected number of hazmat cars derailed. But the, so we can see that as the proportion of hazmat cars increases, the the curve become flatter, right? Because the the positioning uh, does not, you know, it become less sensitive uh, since you have a lot of hazmat cars. Okay, then we can also look at uh, you know different proportion of cars by uh, you know different uh, trend. So this is a longer train. This is one hundred fifty cars. So you know as a proportion of hazmat car increases, more hazmat cars need to be move to the front to minimize the total hazmat car uh, sever uh, severity. So if we can compare the scenario between the 70 and 150 cars. They both have similar trends between the two trend lengths. The different proportion of hazmat cars are required to be moved to the front at the same train speed if you have different you know, trend lengths here. So in general, longer train length results in a higher expected number of hazmat cars derailed, which is you know, also intuitive. Okay, so then, you know, uh, this is the last couple of slides that we want to, again, present some sensitivity analysis um, by looking at a different proportion of the uh, percentage of cars needed to be moved to the front at the same train speed, but with different proportion uh, of the hazmat cars at different trend length. So as a trend length gets longer, uh, we basically can, you know, we move few, uh, less proportion of the cars from the back uh, to the front. And if we, uh, you know, use the same trend length, so let's assume all 150 cars at different uh, hazmat car proportion and at different train speed, we will, you know, move, uh, you know, different. Uh, we will have moved different per percentage of the cars from the uh, from the end to the front. So both the train speed and hazmat car proportion take some have some effects on the uh, the percentage of car that we need to move. And likewise, we can also uh, fix the hazmat car proportion, and we look at different train speed and different train length, and then there they also have the different proportion of the number, uh, different number of cars that we need to move from the uh, from the back to the front in order to achieve the lowest uh, expected number of hazmat cars derailed. Okay, so you you might wonder, you know, what what is you know how can we use it, this model, right? We develop this model. Uh, how how can it be useful? Well, we can. It can be useful when we want to, you know, if we want to understand how should we make up a train. You know, when we need to assemble a train, what would be the uh, optimal train makeup that will have the lowest uh, risk for hazmat cars derailed overall? So let's say that you know we are transporting something uh, from X to Y, and then the average operational speed along the route is 30 miles per hour, and then you know we have in general 110 cars with you know, each train that will have 50% of the cars being hazmat cars. And going through a model, then we can find that optimal point, right? The, the black, uh, the, the point uh, along the curve to find the optimal train makeup. Uh, for example, four locomotives, one buffer car, 12 hazmat cars, and then 50 non-hazmat cars, and then 43 hazmat cars. So this will be kind of like, okay, this uh, using this concept, it will lead to, uh, lower expected number of hazmat cars derailed. However, one of the challenges is that, you know, this example assumes the constant speed over the route. So there are other considerations that we need to think about uh, instead of just simply using this model. And that will be part of our um, research limitations. So in conclusion, the expected number of hazmat cars derailed is generally uh, higher if all the cars are placed in the middle of the train or at the front of the train. You know, we, we saw that in our previous research and our newly developed model, uh, we can observe that as well. The optimal train makeup depends on the train derailment speeds, train length, and percentage of hazmat cars in a train. And there are some other factors uh, that we, uh, we have not considered yet, but we will consider that later. Generally, the optimal train makeup that minimizes the hazmat cars derailment size can be achieved by placing hazmat cars at the back or some, you know, some at the back and some at the front. 
one of the important conclusion from the previous graph that you know I showed and what we found was that there's no particular train makeup that minimizes the number of hazmat cars developed under all likely scenarios. So it depends. In other words, under different operational characteristics, under different train configurations, there there are different ways to uh, that you can configure a train to uh, achieve the lower uh, expected number of cars, a uh, number of hazmat cars derailed. So as I mentioned, there are some uh, model uh, limitations and assumptions that we had to make because of the uh, the underlying models or the data that we have. Uh, and for example, we assume that uh, the the derailment only occurs at one location in the train. Uh, if there are derailments that occur at multiple locations, uh, this model will not be applicable. We also assume that only cars after the first derail, uh, first derail vehicle would derail. Uh, and then we also uh, have not considered the effect of loading status, the real car type, and train dynamics on the, the hazmat cars derailment probability yet. But this is something that we will look into in our future research. Uh, and these are you know, some of our future research uh, directions, including um, updating the, the more the, you know, the FDV and derailment size probability by utilizing the more up-to-date train accident data, and then consider other important operational characteristics uh, for the hazmat car's derailment severity, and also integrate this hazmat car placement model into a more comprehensive real hazmat transportation risk assessment framework. So with that, uh, that will conclude my presentation, and I hope it's not too overwhelming. And then, uh, um, you know, this is a, a one of the in interesting, uh, you know, development of the, the, the 10 car placement, hazmat cars placement model. Uh, hopefully that can tackle some of the, uh, you know, questions that the real industry uh, has about, you know, what, the, what will be the, the safer operation of trains carrying hazardous materials. And so with that, I want to uh, you know, thank again for the great, uh, for the invitation. And uh, if there are any questions or comments, I'm more than willing to answer. Thank you. Professor, I have a, a question for you. I was thinking yes. about the chain of events that has to happen for a derailment to occur? And have you given some thought of what events have to happen for a derailment to occur and then how to feed that back into the model um, somehow? So uh, so were you referring to the, the event series of the hazmat uh, release here? Let me see if I can find that. Wait, do you mean this one? Yeah, so like you were talking about them, but at least the, the um, no, actually, I now that I think of it, what I mean is, what are the physical events or the physical uh, conditions that have to occur for a derailment to happen? And then if that can feed the model somehow, like there has to be a certain kind of speed, there has to be X amount of wheels failing for the derailment to happen, where there has to have some some X or Y accident, and then it has to be concatenated with something else. This, this is the, the thought that I'm having. I don't know if I'm making sense. Uh, yes, thank you. So I think that uh, so you were talking about like the initial events, right? That that caused the train to derail. Um, I mean, the the, the derailment could occur, um, you know, due to a lot of reasons. It could be it could be the infrastructure issue with a, like a broken rail, uh, or you know, or it could be. It could result from the uh, rolling stock issue, for example, a broken wheel, uh, or it could because you know it could be caused by a human uh, errors, like uh, you know, if you are if you are uh, operating a train too fast that caused the derailment. So so there are different uh, causes that could lead to uh, the, the derailment of that. And uh, if you are talking about the release of the particular car. Then you know when when the, when the train derails, there are several cars will you know will derail, and then there will be a physical impact among the cars or between the cars and the ground and some other object. And then there there is a you know different dynamic, and and that that will cause the derailed car to to release. And that that's all that could also uh, come from various reasons. There there's a puncture of the hazmat cars by some other components of the the other cars. 
and so on and so forth. The, the model that, uh, that we present today in particular focus on uh, not directly the occurrence of the derailment, but the after the derailment has occurred, we look at what is the uh, the severity. And of course, there are a lot of factors that will affect the severity of the uh, such derailment. Uh, but the, the, the model that we present today uh, does not directly relate to the physical uh, phenomena of the derailment or the causes of the derailment. But if you're interested in that, we have separate uh, research analysis that look into the various causes that that result in the train derailment. Does that answer your question? I hope that I hope that I understood your question correctly. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking, and I was I was thinking that maybe something like that that, that says the probability the probability of these events occurring could feed into this uh, very nicely and provide some answers. But we have other questions here in the in the room. Uh, Aaron, please go ahead. Uh, Professor, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is related, like uh, between back and front and back scenarios. Which one is more practical? Because if you, I'm assuming if hazmat is all the hazmat costs belong to a certain company, is it tough to do front and back in a practical way over like just go all back? Because if the difference is not much, why would I, what, is, what are the practical differences? Right, that is a great question. Thank you very much. So so one of the, um, we, we actually, uh, we developed this model and then we find out that uh, the front and back uh, you know, results in the lowest expected number of cars derailed. But as you mentioned, uh, to achieve that, we actually need to, um, you know, to achieve that, we actually need to do additional movement of the cars in order to do that, right? So like if we just randomly uh, in, in the terminal or in a yard, if we want to assemble a train, a lot of times the train, uh, we, we just assemble the train uh, based on its destination or the block of the cars that goes to the same destination will be put together and so on and so forth. So if we, in, in, in practical sense, we, we need to do additional movement of that. And sometimes it could be challenging because it's gonna take additional time. Um, and then there, there might not be enough uh, room for, for that or um, the, if the train needs to depart uh, on time or within certain time frame, uh, or there are multiple uh, you know, shippers involved. Uh, it might be, it might not be always the case that we can do that movement. And then this also, the question that you ask also relates to a kind of more, uh, it also relates to the, the, the application of this model. So we can use this model to evaluate the, um, you know, whether or not we want to do this specific, specific arrangement. So if we want to do specific arrangement, for example, putting some of the cars at the front of the train and put some of them in the back, it will incur additional costs in time and in additional movement of the cars that could potentially also create different type of risk. Because if you if you are moving those cars um, additionally, then during this process, you might uh, there might also be some accidents or there might be some errors. And so that's something that we also need to need to consider. So um, so I think the 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 answer is as it depends that uh, sometimes it's it's fine, you know, if, if the operational condition is quite simple, all the cars, uh, we, we have time to switch those cars. Uh, and then the, 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 train the train assembling process uh, does not involve, you know, a lot of destinations and all that. We might be able to do that. Uh, but right now in our particular model, uh, we, we did not uh, look into like, a, um, you know, it's a, the comparison of uh, the additional cost incurred uh, based on these different placement scenarios, but uh, but I think your question is more is important because that relates to the practicality uh, of the application of this model. Thank you, Professor. You have several questions on Zoom. I th I have Marty Schleicher first. Marty, if you want to unmute and uh, talk to us, that would be fine. If not, Professor, you can read the question. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so um, so I think the question from Marty, let me see. Okay, so I'll, I'll read the question now. Uh, how many derailments uh, in, in my data sets and what percentage had locomotives in the position other than the front? And uh, there's another question that is a, is a histogram of total trend length uh, for the data sets available. 
Um, so thank you for the, uh, the question, Marty. So I think that the, oh, we used, uh, so the two underlying models, the first dual vehicle and the total derailment severity uh, were based on the uh, 10 years of the FRA reportable train accident uh, from the FRA uh, real equipment accident, uh, accident incident database. Um, and so we, uh, that, that's what the, the data sets that the two models were, were based upon. And as I alluded to um, in, in the, uh, in the future work, we also uh, plan to update uh, the, the distribution uh, of those using the more recent data. Uh, you mentioned that what a percentage had locomotives in a position other than the front. Uh, That's a good question. And I, I believe that uh, in the previous, uh, the previous study, uh, that it was not investigated uh, directly. But I think that uh, right now we are actually working on uh, a separate uh, research that uh, specifically look into the effect of these, you know, the, uh, the, the different position of the locomotives uh, in, in the front. Uh, and then maybe in the other position as a distributed power trains and what is the uh, effects on uh, the derailment likelihood. Um, so, so I think that, uh, you know, if I look into the data, I will be able to uh, give you the answer about that percentage. Uh, but I, I apologize that right now I don't, I was not able to recall. Uh, but if, uh, if I was able to reach out to you later, I can uh, provide the information to you. And the same thing for uh, the total trend length uh, for the data set. Uh, I think I can also provide you this uh, this information. So, hey. thank you, thank you. Okay. So I think uh, another question from uh, Natasha. So actually, uh, Natasha has three questions. Um, so the first question is related to. Uh, the recent uh, train derailment in the and in fire in the East Pals thing, Ohio, and so I think that uh, so for so this is a, a kind of like a more recent uh, train accident involving uh, the uh, hazmat cars. Um, I think that it's currently it's too early to understand the uh, you know the overall uh, you know the causes and uh, the the details about that. Right now, I think that it's still under uh, the investigation of the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a it's a terrible accident. But uh, right now we uh, we have not been able to reach a, a firm conclusion about that. Um, and so you know we we also have been you know uh, paying attention to this. So later on, if the report uh, comes out, then we will know uh, more about the the details of the the accident. Um, the second question is: uh, Do the length weight of the loads also matter significantly for derailment risk? And are longer, heavier trains more prone to uh, crashing, and so it's a good question. And then I think the the weight of the load, uh, you know, it, it's it's one of the uh, not directly the the variable in the train accident data set. Uh, the, so we do have the total weight of the train in in the uh, accident data sets that derive the uh, the the underlying models. But I think right now the uh, the effects of of that on the the hazmat cars derailment severity. Uh, and needs further investigation. And that's something that we are working on uh, right now. Uh, and then the third question is, how important is it for research like, uh, uh, like yours and other preventive measure to be uh, implemented? Are the powers that, um, are the powers that the real operators, manufacturer, government taking these safety issues seriously enough in the US? Uh, what kind of the pushback is coming from an industry over costs of such changes to reduce risk. So, uh, so that's a good question. We we mentioned about briefly mentioned about the the cost of you know implementing certain uh, hazmat place hazmat car placement strategy. And I think that's one thing that we one of the motivation for developing this model it is because that in the past we we know that maybe putting the car somewhere uh, will be will, will you know potentially be safer. But in order to uh, develop the comparison of the risk trade-off and the cost benefit analysis of specific placement, we need to be able to have some quantitative measure of that. So uh, with the develop development of this model, we can then start to look at the, uh, for example, the, the reduction of the risk by placing hazmat cars at a certain position versus the cost. The cost could be measured in time, could be measured in additional mm -hmm. Um, uh, workforce that that is required to to switch the cars to move the cars around 
and then we can compare that uh, with the money and and all that. So so I think this is one of the functions of this model is that we can start working on this comparison. Um, you know, one of the things that that would be concerned is the time. So like if we want to uh, do the specific arrangement of, of the hazmat cars, then we need to spend additional time and effort switching the cars so that the train is assembled in the specific uh, placement of the hazmat cars. And then it's going to if we do this for all the cars, uh, all the trains carrying hazmat, then I think the, the uh, dual time of those cars and trains in the yard and terminal will, will increase and then it might be some cost that um, that will will create a concern or uh, or other things so so this is something that uh, what we also want to see as a kind of the future direction can we use this model to quantify and to evaluate these trade-offs okay. thank you so much this is natasha who asked the questions just one quick follow-up there i'm just curious is is the U.S. or North America? Are we? Are are, are 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 other parts of the world doing it better than us? Or how do you think? You know, is the industry open to making these kind of changes here? So, so I think uh, the U.S. has the, the particular environments that that kind of uh, motivate the research because we have, you know, we we have the uh, economy of scale of uh, transporting large amount of the uh, the goods through the rail transportation. Uh, for example, uh, in my home country, Taiwan, uh, we don't have a lot of freight volume by rail um, and so you know we it is rare to see uh, freight trains longer than uh, 20 cars or 30 cars and so because of this you know uh, specific in our operational environment uh, I think the the models or the efforts that has been developing for uh, for addressing for example long train issues or or uh, the, the risk and safety of uh, carrying hazardous materials through rail uh, I, I so far uh, I, I see uh, like more development or at least more attempts uh, to, to address the, the, these issues uh, uh, here. And so I think overall that at least I, for experiences, I think uh, the, the experiences of you know, handling and then analyzing and researching these questions uh, in, in the US, it's, uh, I would say it's, it's more uh, compared to uh, other countries around the world. So. Well, thank you very much, Professor. I know you have the rest of your day ahead, so have a good day, and thank you for joining us this early. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you everyone for attending. And then uh, if you have any questions uh, or any comments, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me as a follow-up, and I'm more than happy to address, uh, address those. Thank you again. Thank you very much.